Welcome to Skeptics Night. I'll give you a moment to grab your seat. We know more people are coming in right now. And I want to thank everyone who came out tonight and the folks who are still coming that I may not be able to greet when they get here, but um, we're excited about what's happening here tonight. Skeptic Night, Skeptics Night, I should say, is an opportunity for us as believers to uh, get real questions, hear real questions, and receive real answers. Some of the questions that we are faced with on a daily basis that come up against the faith, opposition of the faith. And so here's an opportunity for my friends, Abdul Murray and Vince Vital from Ravi Zacharias International Ministry. to actually f help facilitate some of these discussions that take place on an everyday basis. I want to explain that we're going to be using a uh, system called Pigeonhole. And what Pigeonhole is, is it's an opportunity to, to submit live questions. And if you look up, they're going to put the information up. You can also vote on any question that interests you that might show up in Pigeonhole. If you have a smartphone, a tablet, or a laptop computer with you, just launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.at into the address bar. Just enter that in there. www.pigeonhole. They got it up there. And then you're going to enter, you're going to key in A B D U V I N C E B T. That's the password. And you'll have an opportunity to actually submit questions live while we're up here on the platform. And I will get the questions. I, I have it tied into my uh, iPad, and you'll have an opportunity to do that. Right now, I want to introduce our guests who are here with us tonight. First, I'll introduce Abdu, and I'll read his little bio. Um, and he'll have an opportunity to share his journey from being a Muslim and coming to his faith in Christ. And then following him, it'll be Vince Vital, who will share a little bit about himself, how he was a skeptic and his journey in coming into his relationship with Christ. Abdul Murray is North American director with Ravi Zacharias International Ministries and is the author of three books, including his latest, Saving Truth, finding meaning and clarity in a post-truth world. For most of his life, Abdu was a proud Muslim who studied the Quran and Islam. After nine years investigating into the historical, philosophical, and scientific underpinning of the major world religions and views, Abdu discovered that Abdu discovered the historical Christian faith can answer the question of the mind and the longing of the hearts. Abdul holds a BA in psychology from the University of Michigan and earned his Juris Doctor from the University of Michigan Law School. Abdul's wife, Nicole, is here with him and his three children, Yusef, L L Lulu, right? Did I get that right? And Nadia. Vince Vital. I feel like I've known Vince for a long time. Is the director of Ravi Zacharias Institute. He was educated at Princeton University and the University of Oxford, and he taught philosophy of religion and served as a faculty member at both of these universities. It was during his undergraduate studies in philosophy at Princeton that Vince took an unexpected journey from skeptic to evangelist. He then completed master's and PhD studies at Oxford, receiving a Daniel M. Sachs graduating scholarship, which was awarded annually to the one graduating Princetonaire, and a Clarendon scholarship supported by Oxford University Press. Vince is incredibly grateful to be married to Joe, and they have a six-week-old son named Raphael.
I now bring to the podium to share with you Abdul Murray. Thank you so much. And what is, is that, can you hear me? Are we good? Oh. No? Oh, am I even on? Oh, we can hear me now, right? I feel like, I feel like the Verizon Wireless. Well, no, no, he switched. He, ch he changed teams. Uh, I'm going to tell you, it's interesting enough that I'll talk to you about my journey of faith where I switched teams as well um, from a, a, a d d devoted Muslim to becoming a, a Christian. Uh, as we talk about this, faith, this question, is faith in God delusional or is Christianity itself delusional? And as we think about this question, I'm reminded of a story. There was these, um, this guy who was walking down the street in a busy, you know, streets like we have here in Brooklyn, and he happens to see a, a sign in a travel agency back when there used to be travel agencies. He sees this sign that says River Cruise $100. So he, he's like, that can't be true. So he walks into the travel agency says, your sign says River Cruise $100. Is that in full? They said, yeah, that's the full price, $100. He said, well, sold. And he pulls out a crisp $100 bill, puts it on the counter, and slides it over. And when he does that, bonk, he gets hit on the head. And he wakes up, rubbing his head, to find himself floating in a barrel down a river. And he looks over, and he sees this other guy, about 10 yards away, rubbing his head, also floating in a river. And the guy says to him, hey, do they serve lunch on this cruise? And the other guy says, they didn't last year. <laughs> now, the point of that story is that oftentimes people think that people of faith are like the second guy. That no matter how many times you keep coming to the well or keep going to find out what the worldview of Christianity actually is, you'll still believe it even when there's no good reasons or actually strong reasons to disbelieve Christianity, you'll keep coming back and keep coming back. And because you're delusional or you have wishful thinking, you'll get hit on the head and keep thinking, maybe this year, maybe this year, who knows? There was a phrase by Richard Dawkins. He said it a while back. It's attributed to Richard Dawkins, at least. He says, a delusion is a persistent false belief held in the face of strong contradictory evidence, especially as a symptom of a psychiatric disorder. God is a delusion and a pernicious delusion. When one person suffers from a delusion, it's um, called insanity. When many people suffer from it, it's called religion. Now that is a strong statement. The question is, is that true? Now I can tell you this, while I journeyed from my former worldview, the religion of my birth, from Islam to, to Christianity, when I was a Muslim, I had explored major views, including atheism and other things as well. But Christianity uh, got my focus because it was obviously the majority religion. One of the important things that I thought about Christianity was that it was delusional thinking. But this idea that there's a God, that's fine, but that God could be three and one at the same time. This seemed ridiculous to me. This idea, how is God three and one? How does that make any kind of sense? And if God the Father needs help from God the Son, how, come that, how could God need help if he's God? And Christians had very little response to what I was saying. Also, this idea that God could become a man. If God is divine, therefore he's unlimited. And what it means to be human means that you're limited. How could God become a man? That makes no sense. And so it seemed delusional to me. Then the idea that God himself not only would become a man, but would die on a cross at the hands of the very sinners he creates, that seemed delusional as well because it seemed to insult the very idea of what it means to be God. So I thought it was delusional as well. But a funny thing happened on the way to the mosque, as they say, and I began to see that the credibility of the Christian faith was more than what I had thought it was originally. It wasn't such delusional thinking. One of the reasons why I think people consider Christian faith to be delusional is the misunderstanding of what faith actually means in the first place. If you look at a Dawkins, uh, Dawkins definition, you have this idea that faith is belief without evidence or maintaining your belief in the face of contrary evidence. But that's not what faith is at all. You will never find that definition or even an example of it in the Bible anywhere. The Bible doesn't describe faith this way. How the Bible describes faith is that faith is active trust. That's what the Greek word faith in the original manuscripts actually means. It means trust. Everybody has trust. Most of you are sitting down. None of you tested the chair for its structural integrity before you put your bulk into it. Not a one of you did that. 
Why? Because you have enough evidence, but not complete evidence, that the chair will hold you up. But one day, if the laws of physics pertain, and they do, the chair will eventually stop working, and it'll break under somebody's weight. Some of you came by train. Some of you came by car. I guarantee you, none of you inspected the train for safety. Yet you trusted your life to it. Why? Because you had enough evidence, though not complete, you had enough evidence to trust the train. In science, we trust that scientists are telling the truth. If they're not telling the truth, a lot of times, and they haven't in the, in the past, we can lead, go down erroneous roads. We have to trust someone down the road. Faith is simply trust. That's what the word in the Bible actually means. The question is, the, qu the question is not, do you have faith? Everyone has faith in something. The question is, what is your faith placed in, and is it worthy? And I can tell you from having studied the history, we can get into this in the Q&A. You're going to hear some, some summary statements from Vince and I. It's not meant to be comprehensive during our opening statements. We want to get to your questions as much as possible and maybe get into detail then. But I can tell you this. When I was studying the veracity of the Bible, when I was studying the reality, the historical claim that Jesus actually died and actually rose from the dead, I saw the amazing amount of evidence there was to confirm for me that the resurrection of Jesus was not a fact uh, of hope, but an actual fact of history, that it was real, that my hope is not based in something that maybe happened, but in something that I am quite sure it did happen. Faith is trust, which means this. I can trust what God will do in the future, though I don't have perfect knowledge of what that is, because of what God has done in the past. That's what faith is all about. And everyone has a modicum of faith in something. But then the objection still Continues. Well, faith is a science stopper. Saying that it's God and saying, oh, God does all these things, he creates the world, is a way to stop the, the scientific investigation altogether. You know, if we don't know how lightning uh, was created, we just plug God into the gaps of our knowledge. If we don't know what tornadoes are about, or we don't know why the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, we don't know this, just plug God into your gaps of knowledge. I remember sitting at an open forum where a friend of mine was giving a talk on science and faith. And I joined him for the Q&A, and a young man stood up in the back, and he said, the problem I have is that, yes, there were Christians who were scientists, some of our best and our brightest, by the way. Some of the pioneers of science were, were, were Christians. And he says, but the problem is, I think that they actually checked their religion at the door. When they put on their lab coat, they stopped being religious. When they put it, took it off, they, they, they resumed their Christianity, because Christianity inherently stops the pursuit of science, because it just says, God did it, that's all I care about, in the discussion. As far as I'm concerned, and maybe I've been fortunate in my life, I don't know of any Christians who think like that. So you know what's interesting to me? Have you read Proverbs 25, verse 2, where it says this phrase, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, it is the glory of kings to seek things out. Why does the Bible say that? That it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, it is the glory of kings to seek things out. It's not that God conceals something so that we never discover it and just say, oh, God did it, that's all I need to know. That's not what it is. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter so that you and I can actually think God's thoughts after him as we explore the natural world he's provided for us. It is the glory of God to conceal something because it becomes the glory of kings to seek it out. He has given you and I the delight of discovery. The Bible actually encourages science. My son is here, and I'll tell you, when he was first born, a few years into after, he was bo after he was born, he showed an affinity and a love for letters and numbers. So like good first-time parents, I bought everything you could think of about letters and numbers for my son. And I sat him down, and he had, you know, we bought him one of these, these laptops. It's not really a laptop, it's a speak and spell, but it looks like a laptop to fool the kid and think he's got a computer. He was sitting at the table, playing with his, lap his laptop. My wife and I were talking, and then I hear the word come out of his mouth. He says, fat, fat. Like, what, did he just read? And I look at the screen, and sure enough, F-A-T is on the screen. So I hit the next word button, and it says C-A-T. He goes, cat, cat? I was like, oh my goodness, my son's reading, my son can read, oh my goodness, it's the best thing ever. So he starts, you know, beaming with delight, and he's like all happy and squealing with delight as a little kid would. I'm hitting that number button, or that button, as money pocket, next word, next word, next word. I was so excited about his discoveries, he was delighted in his discoveries, I was more delighted in his discovery. And Nicole and I were just so enraptured in the fact that we're seeing my son get it. There's a delight in discovery. And the Bible actually encourages it. It encourages it. It is the glory of kings 
to, uh, to seek out a matter because God has concealed it because he gives you and I the gift of discovery. The Bible and the word, the idea of faith is not a science stopper. It's actually an encourager. It wants you to explore the tapestry of the world, whether it's this planet or many others that God has created for us. So when you see that faith is not what the caricatures have actually said, Now the question is, do the answers of Christianity actually apply in some meaningful way to the different worldviews that are out there? Does it actually answer the deepest questions, which is why we have a skeptics night, because skeptics have real questions, they have deep questions, and what we hope is that we can offer them at least some credible kind of answers that show that the questions are affirmed as the gospel begins to answer them. So you look at the secular humanist. Secular humanism is, is, is... a worldview, uh, most, a, a lot of atheists are secular humanists. What it means is humanism. Humanism is the idea that human beings are special, that they are not mere animals, they're not just meat computers, nor are they gifted chimps. There's something about us that's more than that, but secular humanism. In other words, we don't need God to exist to justify our specialness. That's the secular humanist idea. Here's the problem. In order to uh, uh, offer some kind of meaning to what you and I actually are, to offer some kind of moral dimension to life. If we are the pinnacle, if there's nothing higher than us, then we become the measure of all things. If that's the case, then everything is a matter of human opinion. And some human beings think that other human beings should be property. Other human beings think that other human beings shouldn't even exist at all. We are notoriously terrible at this. With all of our education, we stay that way. We are still, in all of our seeming genius, we still are bad at this. Yes, things are ending, like illiteracy, and they're waning and all these things, but we're also thinking up of great ways to kill each other from a distance. Because if human beings are the determiner of all things, then all we are left with is human opinion, and it changes, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But if God exists, then he infuses our lives with actual meaning and value. I was sitting down at dinner with a friend. <clears throat> and we were friends in school, and he was an agnostic, really basically said there is no God, but he left some room open for it. And he asked me this question. He says, how can you tell me that this God you believe in is good and values me and my mother when he let her die when I was 10 years old? That's a real question. That's not just philosophy anymore, friends. The philosophical rubber has met the existential road, and he needs an answer that isn't just intellectually defensible, but that actually is relevant to his life. How do you answer? Because I was close to him, I thought I could give him some stuff to talk about with this and you know, go into some of the meat of the intellectual answer, but it ultimately became a matter of value for him. So I asked him, I said, you asked me this question, how do I know that God values me or my mother or is good if you let her die? Here's my question back to you, how do you know anything has value? How do you know the value of anything? How do you know it? You know how valuable something is by what you're willing to pay for it. A blind, pitiless, indifferent universe neither knows nor cares about your life or your death or your mother's life and your death. And so her, li- her, her death is meaningless. So was her life. But if there's a God, not just any old God, but the God of the Bible, then her life not only has meaning, it also has value. Because if you know how valuable something is by what you're willing to pay for it, I said, you can know something very serious. See, the Bible tells me and tells you, you are made in God's image, which automatically makes you immeasurably valuable. But it also tells you and tells me that we have strayed far from what was intended and we have flawed ourselves. And we therefore, because of our hearts, we owe God a debt. But we cannot pay that debt. It has to be him himself who pays the debt because he is perfect and we are not. So God pays the debt that we are owed. But that debt we owe him is not just, I'm sorry, or I'll do better next time. It's actually our lives. And so in order to pay the debt of life, God gives of his own. Here's the punchline. I told my friend this. You can know that your mother and you have an immeasurable value because the immeasurable God paid an immeasurable price at the cross to spend an immeasurable eternity with you and with her. That's what he looked at me and he said, now that is worth believing. You go from secular humanism and the search for human value, then you go to Eastern thought. 
Eastern belief systems in religion, where the idea is this, whether it's Hinduism or Buddhism or the, the Western versions of it, like New Age and Scientology and all these things, or the Oprah and the Chopra and all this stuff. The central idea in these, these systems of belief is that life is an illusion, that you are either deluded into thinking that you're an actual self, a la Buddhism, or that you're not a divine being. You're really a divine being, and you have the delusion that you're just a human. If you woke up from that illusion, you would cease all the suffering because the suffering itself is an illusion. That's what the whole cycle of death and rebirth and karma and all this stuff is about, is getting rid of the illusion of your humanity. The Christian faith tells you this. Your pain is not an illusion. It's quite real. It's quite real. In fact, it's so real that the creator of all the universe, the source of all being, himself experiences it, not so that you can escape it, but so that he can actually deal with it so that there will be a time in heaven where there is no more death and no more tears. He wipes every tear from their eye, which suggests to me and to you that he walks up to you, looks you square in the face, puts his thumb on your cheek, and wipes it off personally. You see, pain isn't just this arbitrary feeling or an illusion. Pain is the signal of value. Think about this. If you love someone and they leave or they're taken from you and you feel nothing, did you really love them? Not at all. It can't be. It can't be. So if they're an illusion, if the pain you feel when they're gone from you is an illusion, then maybe your value for them was an illusion. Maybe their value itself was an illusion. But if there is real pain, not because of an illusion, but because they are truly real and they are valuable to you, it signals value. You and I have that kind of value. Back to my friend who wanted to know if his mother had value. The cross tells you and tells me, and it tells the Eastern mind there's a value. So you go from the secular humanist philosophies to the Eastern religious systems, and then to the wisdom of my birth, Islam. And with this, I'll bring it to a close and invite Vince to come on up. You've heard the phrase, Allahu Akbar, right? Allahu Akbar, you've all heard this, and usually it's in a bad context because of the way the media uh, usually displays it. The reality is most Muslims say Allahu Akbar all the time. Peaceful Muslims who have no ideas of violence in their hearts say Allahu Akbar. It literally means God is greater. That's what it means. So for a Muslim, and when I was a Muslim especially, God's greatness was the central idea, the most important idea about God was that he was incomparably great. There can be no being greater than God. And I thought the Trinity, the Incarnation, and the cross all insulted God's greatness. But you look at these things and you begin to see something. That what Islam actually off, uh, hopes is true about God's greatness actually becomes demonstrably true in the gospel. If God is truly great, he would be in unmatch unmatchingly just. He would be maximally just. He could not compromise his justice. He would also be uncompromisingly merciful or forgiving. So how is he both? How does he be completely just and not compromise and be completely merciful or forgiving without compromise? How does he give you what you deserve and what you don't deserve without compromising either? The cross is the answer to this because in the cross, God himself does in fact punish sin because Jesus voluntarily takes it on himself like a guarantor in the law. He says, I will take on their, their payment for them and then he takes it. And he takes it to satisfy justice so that we can be forgiven of our sins if we accept what he's done on our behalf. Justice is satisfied, mercy is granted, and neither is compromised. It's the coalescing of things. The one thing I love to see throughout the, throughout the message of the gospel is the way things converge. And God's, God's greatness and his love converge. And this is what got it for me. This is what did it for me. When I was searching, I was looking for a God who was great, Allahu Akbar, the greatest possible being. Then it occurred to me, the greatest possible being would express the greatest possible ethic, which is love, in the greatest possible way. And the greatest possible way to express love is self-sacrifice. You and I sacrifice for those who love us back, maybe for a stranger, but not for those who hate us. We don't do it like that. It is God himself whose love is greater than our love. And naturally it would be. If he's the greatest possible being, he would be greater than us. He doesn't sacrifice for those who love him. He sacrifices for those who hate him because he's the greatest possible being. I remember where I was when I read the words in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. I remember where I was. 
where it says, for God demonstrates his love, his perfect love, his matchless love, in that while we were sinners, God haters, Christ died for us. The greatest possible being, expressing the greatest possible ethic, which is love in the greatest possible way. Everything that I was hoping was true about Jesus, about God, I should say, in Islam, was true about him in Christianity. That's why the hymn writers write in Here is Love about the convergence of justice and peace that comes from mercy. It says, grace and love like mighty rivers flowed incessant from above, and heaven's peace and perfect justice kissed a guilty world in love. They converge. Let me close with this. Christian faith is not delusional because it makes sense of so many of our pursuits. It validates the question for the secular humanist who wants to know how do we know that human beings have value in an objective sense outside of human opinion. The cross is the answer because you know how much something is worth by what you pay for it and the cross is the statement that you're worth something. Secular humanism, pantheism, Eastern thought, wants to know how we escape the illusion of suffering, the cross again is the answer to say that suffering is not an illusion and that you're worth so much that God himself will suffer for you in order to have you himself and fulfill your purpose. And then the Muslim wants to know, how is God great? Again, it's the cross. Once again, the greatest possible being, expressing the greatest possible ethic in the greatest possible way. Isn't it fascinating? that the answer to every worldview that's out there, in some sense, to one of their questions, their deepest questions, isn't some high philosophy, it's a thing that happened in history. God writes his poetry with the pen of history, friends. The word, the, the root word for the word crucifixion, the root of that word, crucifixion, is the word crux. Do you know what that means? It's the place where things come together, where they converge and then they turn like the crux of a lever, to move a great weight. It was on this lonely hill in this forgotten outpost of the Roman Empire that a relatively unknown Jewish preacher, who was really God the Son incarnate, changed everything. He told human beings they have value. He said that pain wasn't an illusion, but he came to deal with it, and he showed you God's greatness. All three in one action. That's why I think of the hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross, it says, see from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down, did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown. He does that for you, he does that for me. He justifies your desire for meaning, he justifies your desire to be free of suffering, and he tells you, achieving all of that, that he is in fact great. And he proves it in history, not just hope, through his resurrection, what his son did for us. And we'll be celebrating that soon. I pray that you come to know that. I'm looking forward to your questions. God bless you. Thank you so much for giving me a listen. Well, it's such a joy to be here with you this evening at Brooklyn Tabernacle, a church and a ministry uh, that I know Abdu and I have both admired from afar for a long time. Uh, great to see so many friendly faces. Good to see the rest of you as well. <laughs> That's rule number one. Got to laugh at my jokes. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Holiday. I want to thank Rochelle. Uh, they and others on the team here really made this happen. I want to thank Abdu for his vision uh, for Skeptics Night, which is an initiative that's starting here in this church and going to be spreading more widely across the country uh, as well. I want to thank Brooklyn Tabernacle especially for having this event uh, on an evening that's an off day for the Yankees. I'm very thankful. <laughs> very thankful for that, especially at the beginning of the season. Looking forward to those 300 home runs this year. Uh, that was the first time, Pastor, that Raphael was uh, introduced in my bio at the beginning of a talk. That was quite special. Uh, thank you for doing that. So he is six weeks old now, so my wife, uh, Joe, and I, we, we pretty much have it nailed, pretty much have this parenting thing down. I mean, it's just all over the place. The other day, we're in the kitchen, 
and it's just like, try to cook the food, the baby's crying, get the pacifier, oh, we got to change the diaper. And Joe has Raphael in her arm, and she's trying to cook at the same time, and she just goes, not realizing what's in her arm, she goes, can you hold this? <laughs> I might be in trouble for saying that in public when I get, when I get home. <laughs> Uh, tonight is about questions, as Abdu uh, has said, and we really hope that tonight you will question our beliefs. I think one of the biggest problems in our society is that we take questioning of our beliefs as a problem. We take that as an attack. We take it as a sign of disrespect, as an offense. We take that as a threat. We actually think very differently about that. We think questions are a gift because questions are the way you get to know someone. If I want to get to know you, I ask you questions about yourself. And then I'm not satisfied with just the superficial answer. I'm going to ask you deeper questions about yourself. I'm going to want to know about even those confusing parts of who you are, even the challenging parts of who you are. Questioning is how you get to know a person. It is the starting point for a relationship. And so if, as Abdu and I think, the Christian God is a personal God, then questions are also the starting point for getting to know him. They are the starting point for a relationship with God. And if you take anything away from tonight, I hope it will be this, that questions are not at odds with the Christian faith, but they are actually the very starting point of Christian faith. Now, is faith in God delusional? Some of you here tonight may think so. I once thought so. Some of you may be happy to make that claim out loud. Others of you may be churchgoers. You may identify as Christians, but in the privacy of your own mind, you may wonder, is this idea of faith in God, is it just irrational? Is it anti-scientific? Is it just too extraordinary to believe? And so today, I'd like to present you with a new and a highly scientific argument for the existence of God that I think is going to become very influential in the years ahead. And this is that argument, if we can have it up on the screen. If there is no God, how come the world fits so perfectly into a chicken? All right, don't worry. I've got some better arguments on the way. <laughs> but for a long time, for a long time, my story, I thought the chicken argument was about as rational as faith could be. I thought faith had to be blind. I thought faith was for people who didn't think hard enough. I was studying philosophy at Princeton University at the time. And I was challenged to read the Bible. I was always up for a challenge. So I began to read through. And I would cross things out, and I would add things, and I'd actually write a big BS in the margin wherever I disagreed. And Christians would look over my shoulder and say, Vince, why do you have a BS in the margin of your Bible? And I'd say, oh, that verse makes for a great Bible study. <laughs> that was my starting point. But things changed for me. They changed because I, as I continued reading the Bible, as I continued wrestling my way through it, I found myself falling in love with the person of Jesus, the way that he carried himself, the way that he treated people. A woman was caught in adultery, and the leaders wanted to stone her. And he said, you who are without sin, throw the first stone. And one by one, they all walked away. And I kept reading this book, and, and soon I realized that Jesus made some very big claims about himself. He claimed to have existed before Abraham, who existed thousands of years ago. He claimed to be able to forgive sins, not just sins against him, but sins in general. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who dies but believes in me will live even though they die. He said that to have seen him was to have seen God and that him and God were one and the same. And I'm thinking, who is this guy? As C.S. Lewis pointed out, when someone makes those types of claims about themselves, you only have so many options. Was he just a big liar? Was he mentally ill and he really believed all of these things about himself mistakenly? 
could it actually be the case that he was telling the truth? And I kept reading, and I got to the book of Acts, which gives a history of the early church, and I started to come across all sorts of words that I never thought I would see in the Bible, words like reasoning and examining, explaining, convincing, debating, disputing, persuading, even proving. I read that the Thessalonians, one people group, were more noble than that the Bereans, excuse me, were more noble than the Thessalonians. Why? Not because they had blind faith, but because they examined the scriptures daily to determine if the things they were being told were true. And I kept reading, and then eventually I got all the way back to the book of Hebrews, and I came across a biblical definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. And I thought to myself, this is not a God who is asking me to take some blind leap of faith. Not at all. This is a God who's asking me to love him not only with my heart and my soul and my strength, but also with all of my mind. And I can remember sitting in my dorm room and thinking to myself that if God really made me, and if he made me with this mind, then he would want an honest intellectual search to at least point in his direction. And ultimately, that is exactly what I found. But first, I needed to ask questions. First, I had to be honest about my skepticism. And the primary question that I had to ask was, is this all just too crazy? Is it all just too extraordinary to believe? An immaterial God, a virgin birth, a man truly risen from the dead. Is it all just too miraculous? Now, if at the outset you decide that a miracle is impossible, well then of course you're gonna come to the conclusion that a miracle never happened. But I wanna ask the question, is that really a rational assumption to make? Have you ever taken a moment to just step back and think about what a miracle it is that we are even sitting here right now thinking about miracles? that there just happens to be this enormous universe, nearly 100 billion light years in size, that right now, as you sit here, you are rotating at 1,000 miles an hour. You're flying around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour as part of a galaxy being hurled through the universe at over a million miles an hour, all with laws so orderly that human life exists, life so complex that if you took the DNA strands in your 100 trillion cells and laid them end to end, you could get to the sun and back 600 times. Utterly remarkable can be tempting to think that Christianity is too extraordinary to believe. But criticism without alternative is empty. That's a sentence worth remembering. If you tell me, Vince, you have a terrible accent. It, it's the worst. It's, it's the most horrible accent that I've ever heard. And I say, okay, look, I'm, I'm someone who's willing to take criticism. I'm willing to take that on board, and I'm pretty good at accents. So tell me, which accent should I try to adopt instead? And then if you say to me, well, actually, now that I think about it, I've never heard an accent more beautiful or more pleasant to the ears than the New Jersey accent. <laughs> if you said that to me, your criticism would dissolve, right? Your criticism wouldn't have any force anymore because you haven't given me an alternative. Criticism without alternative is empty. A hypothesis is only probable or improbable relative to what alternative hypotheses are out there. So what are our alternatives? Well, first, consider with me big picture explanations of the universe. How did all of this get here? There are only three options. Option number one, God made it. And as a Christian, I might just put my hand up and say, wow, that is an incredible, extraordinary option. But what are the alternatives? Alternative number two, the universe just popped into existence from nothing for no reason whatsoever. Well, this too is a very odd option. The physical stuff in our everyday lives doesn't generally pop in and out of existence. If it doesn't now, why should we think that it did at the beginning? Or a third alternative. 
Maybe the universe or some series of universes has just always existed, extending infinitely back in time. Well, now maybe you can explain each part of the universe with a part that came before it, but you still have absolutely no explanation for why there is this enormous, intricate universe in the first place. I think that's remarkable, too. These three options, they exhaust the relevant alternatives, and every single one of them is absolutely extraordinary. Every single one of them is well outside the realm of the ordinary. And even if you look at these and you decide, you know what, I'm going to remain agnostic on the whole thing because I can look at these and see all three of them are pretty crazy. Well, you're still logically committed to one of these three things being true, and that's just as remarkable. The conclusion, I think, is that we live in a miraculous world. I don't think there is any getting around that fact. Whether you are a theist, an atheist, or an agnostic, I don't think anyone can avoid that. We have to believe one way or another in something absolutely extraordinary. I was reminded of this a number of years ago. I was emailing back and forth with a friend of mine, a retired Princeton professor, and he was detailing some of his objections to Christianity. And he wrote a long email with a long list of objections, explaining them. And then at the bottom of the email, his last line, as if to trump all other arguments, was, nor can I believe in a virgin birth. Okay, no further argument or explanation. As if to say it would be crazy to believe in such a thing. And I began drafting an email back to him, trying to figure out how maybe I could persuade him that Perhaps he could believe in a virgin birth. And then it dawned on me. He already does. In fact, everyone believes in a virgin birth, whether they realize it or not. As a Christian, I believe that Jesus, as God himself, was miraculously born of a virgin. And again, I might put my hand up and say that's a pretty extraordinary belief to have. But criticism without alternative is empty. What are the alternatives? Take the brilliant Cambridge physicist Stephen Hawking's attempt to propose an atheistic birth of our universe. He said the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason there is something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. Is that any less miraculous of a birth than Jesus being born of a virgin? That sounds a lot like a virgin birth to me. Or... Consider the words of the atheist philosopher Quentin Smith, a prolific philosopher, 12 books, over 140 articles to his name, and here is his best explanation. He says, the fact of the matter is that the most reasonable belief is that we came from nothing, by nothing, and for nothing. We should acknowledge our foundation in nothingness and feel awe at the marvelous fact that we have a chance to participate briefly in this incredible sunburst that interrupts without reason the reign of non-being. That definitely sounds like a virgin birth. <laughs> and I think, again, we're led to the same conclusion. We live in a miraculous world. There is no getting around that. It's not a matter of whether you believe in a virgin birth. It's just a matter of which virgin birth you choose to accept. You can choose to accept the virgin birth of an atheistic universe that is indifferent to us, a universe where there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, as atheist Richard Dawkins has put it. Or you can believe in the virgin birth of a God who loved us so much and so deeply that he came to be born among us and to live beside us, to call us family, and to call us friends. The exact opposite of blind, pitiless indifference. Someone who is not blind to anything about you and yet loves you. Someone who knows you in absolute full and yet loves you in absolute full with extravagance. What an incredible gift. Is Christianity crazy? Maybe. But we live in a crazy world. Every person regardless of what they do or don't believe about God, is committed to believing something extraordinary. Every one of us in this room this evening, we're all in the same boat, 
in that respect. The question is, do we have good reason to believe it? After an extended search, I came to the conclusion that I believed I did have good reason to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be and that he backed up those big claims about who he was by truly, physically, bodily, miraculously rising from the dead. And Abdu glanced in this direction as well, and I hope you'll ask us why we think we can have so much confidence in that during the time of Q&A. I was actually reading a book on the resurrection, and I closed the back cover of that book in my dorm room when for the first time I was genuinely persuaded in both my mind and my heart that Jesus was who he had claimed to be and that God had put his stamp of approval on the divinity of Jesus through raising him from the dead. And I dropped to my knees right there in 122 Jolene Hall, and I told God that I wanted to trust him with my life. I could become a Christian right then and there. And I believe this is the only religion that can say this because God wasn't asking me to do anything to try to climb my way up to him. He was just asking me to accept that he loved me so much that he had already made his way down to me. A friend of mine once said to me, Vince, do you think we can know God? And I said, yeah, sure. But he came back, he pressed me, he said, he said, no, he said, do you think we can really know God? And he was making a distinction between two different types of knowing. G.K. Chesterton made a similar distinction. In philosophy, we tend to speak about propositional and non-propositional knowledge. But it's a simple idea. How can I know if this jacket fits? Well, there's two ways. I could check all of the measurements on the rack in the store, see if it's my size. Or I could pick it up and I could put it on. I think both are important. Me personally, I probably never would have picked the jacket up if I hadn't looked into the measurements of the philosophy and the science and the history and the biology and the cosmology and seen that they were in the right vicinity. But ultimately, there is no substitute for picking that jacket up and trying it on. God generously conceals matters for us to investigate them. He wants us to use our minds to come to know him. So generous, the infinite God of the universe would want us to participate in coming to know him deeply and in relationship. He wants us to look at the history and the philosophy and the science and the cosmology and all of it. But he also says, taste and see that the Lord is good. He also says, clothe yourself in Christ. He also says, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. It's hard to put into words the experience of coming to know God personally when you go beyond the evidence and step into relationship. But there was one guy who I met not long ago. He put what I experienced into very vivid and compelling language. He had journeyed with our team for a week. He had inspected the measurements, but now he knew that if he was to go further, if he was to know God in the fullness with which he wanted to, he was going to have to give up his distance. He was going to have to take a step of relational trust towards him. And he bowed his head with our team, and he did that, and he told God in his own words that he wanted to trust him for the first time. And when he opened his eyes as a new Christian, these were the very first words out of his mouth. He said, I have always felt alone and like I've had to wear a mask. He said, but now this is the first time in my life that I can be fully myself and fully alive. No philosophy can do that. No religion can do that. But I believe in the deepest part of my heart that Jesus can. 
I've seen him do that in my life. I've seen him do that in Abdu's life. I know many of you have seen him do that in your life. And that is the offer that is on the table for every single one of us. The freedom to inspect the claims and ask the hard questions, but ultimately then to bow our heads and to open our eyes back up and saying, I'm no longer alone. And any mask that I've been wearing, I can now take off and be fully myself and fully alive. That's my hope for every one of you and I'm looking forward to your questions. As uh, we get to set up for the Q&A part of the questions, just want to let you know that um, during the Q&A, uh, you can continue to feed in your live questions. Um, also, just wanted to let you know that um, after the meeting, they have product up in the mezzanine lobby uh, where you can get Ravi Zachariah's new book. It hasn't even come out yet, but uh, it doesn't come out until April 2nd, The Logic of God. And they're selling it tonight for $15. So if you're interested, you can um, grab a copy of that. And so that being said, I'm going to ask Abdu and Vince to join me up here. So we can begin to answer some of the tough questions and give you guys some real answers. Weren't they great? Well, this is it's the moment that we've all been looking forward to is just actually getting some of these tough questions out there and uh, And so they're coming through three different feeds. I have some questions that we have captured while people were going online and submitting questions. Microphone? Oh, yeah. Uh, there's supposed to be a microphone there. Yeah. And um, also, uh, pigeonhole that I spoke about earlier. Um, we have quite a few questions that have come through pigeonhole. I'll be uh, looking at those live questions. And then we'll also give... Uh, folks in the audience an opportunity to ask a question. Um, so I'll, I'll start off with one of the questions we received earlier in the week or earlier in the month. And it says this. It says, doesn't the Bible condone slavery, sexism, and genocide? <laughs> so his next question, uh, if you don't mind, at the mic. <laughs> Hey, give Abdu the hard ones. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I was going to make a joke earlier that I'll answer the longer questions and Vince can answer the shorter questions. Uh, but uh, no, this is, a, this is a very deep and serious question, so if you'll permit me for a moment, it takes a little bit of um, uh, unraveling because all those are very different issues, right? Does the Bible condone slavery? Does the Bible condone genocide and sexism? Uh, and sometimes when you read this stuff, you can actually think, okay, look, the word slavery is in the Bible, and there's actually regulations for slavery, and the word slave is used over and over again. God commands, uh, through Moses, Joshua, to go and kill all the Canaanites, leave nothing alive that breathes, the Bible actually says. And then, of course, there's this, this sense in which only males have a rise to, the, to this level of priesthood or all these kind of things. Um, these are very serious objections, and in fact, uh, I remember the very first speaking engagement I ever did. And by the way, feel free to come up to the microphone and line up. You don't have to wait for anybody else to invite you. Come on to the microphone and line up. We'd love to see you eyeball to eyeball and ask <laughs> your question. Um, the um, speaking engagement was over, my very first one outside of a church. I was actually in a university. They took me downstairs, and they showed me this showcase from the Secular Humanist Association uh, at the um, school, and it had... The, uh, the, the Bible, and it had the words false written on it, and it had all these things, these verses about slavery, genocide, sexism, right in there. And it said, this is false. Then it had other books by atheists and said, true. So this is a very forcible, forceful objection. A couple of things. On the, on the slavery issue, the, word, the Bible does actually use the word which can be translated as slavery. In fact, my name, Abdu, is a Semitic name. It's Arabic, and the word Abed means either servant or slave. The word in Hebrew is oved, which also means servant or slave, but it can mean both. 
Now, when you look at the way the Bible describes what it, what it suggests to be regulated slavery by the people of Israel, it doesn't actually regulate slavery when we think of antebellum south, when we think of human trafficking. It doesn't, re doesn't regulate this. What it's talking about is indentured servitude, what's actually voluntary. So if people owe debts and they can't pay their debts, they actually work their debts off. The Bible has a system whereby even these people who actually are voluntarily involved in a indentured servitude are to be set free from their debts every seven years. And if they choose to remain with, their, with the person to whom they're serving, they can actually choose of their own free will or be set free. It's not even close to the same thing, not even remotely close to the same thing as what we see and when we think of the word slavery. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the idea of the genocide. The, the Bible describes um, this command by God to give to Moses, and jo Moses gives to Joshua this command to kill all the Canaanites. Now, what's interesting is, is that you know, I'm from the Middle East, so I understand how Middle Eastern hyperbole actually works. When you say something in the Middle East, it's not always just go do this, A, B, C. It's not the sense of the exactitude of Western speech. There's a lot of hyperbole. There's a lot of exaggeration in stuff. Believe me, talk to a Middle Easterner for five minutes and you'll notice there's a lot of exaggerating going on. Um, the Bible describes that Joshua had did all as Moses had commanded, and he wiped them out. But then a few verses later, the Canaanites are still running around, and God gives orders, don't marry Canaanites or don't mix with the Canaanites, this kind of thing. That's interesting because if, in fact, God had commanded genocide and the Bible says that Joshua did all that Moses commanded, you would expect to see no Canaanites running around. But there are Canaanites running around, which suggests that what the meaning actually is isn't that God commanded to wipe out the Canaanite people, but to wipe out their way of life. And why? This is why it's not genocide. It's actually judgment. Because what the Canaanites were doing was they were sacrificing, among many other things, they were sacrificing their children to their gods. They were actually burning them alive as sacrifices to their gods, among other horrible things, temple prostitution, cult stuff that was happening as well. So God allows, in fact, if you see in the Bible, God allows the sins of the Amorites, for example, to exist for 400 years during the, the, Israel, the, Israel, the uh, Hebrew captivity in Egypt. So he allows them to try to fix themselves for 400 years, to repent of them, of their ways for 400 years. And when they won't do it, that's when he uses Israel to judge them. So it's not genocide, it's judgment. And how do I know it's not genocide? Like it's those people over there. They're gross and icky because they're not us. Why? I know this because God used other nations like Assyria, like Egypt, like Babylon to judge the Israelites. So it wasn't just one-sided tribalism. God was beating out justice evenly for everyone. Then the sexism question. A couple of things on this that are very important, and then I'll close. First, what do you see? You don't see just men occupy the highest offices. Deborah, in the book of Judges, was a judge, appointed a judge by God over men. You see the heroism of Yocheved when she puts her son, Moses, in a basket so that he doesn't get murdered by the Egyptians. You see this important fact, that it was the women who actually were oftentimes financially supporting Jesus' own ministry, which was considered scandalous back then. But Jesus let them do it, because he knew what they were doing was important. Then you see Martha and Mary, and you see this interchange and this interaction, where Martha is saying, Mary is sitting at your feet, Jesus, and she's not helping me to do women's work, as it were. So ingrained in the sexism of her, of her culture was Mary that she actually was willing to say, put Martha in her place, I'm sorry, put Mary in her place, don't let her sit at your feet and learn stuff, have her be in the kitchen with me. <laughs> Jesus said, Martha, you're worried about a lot of things, but Mary has chosen what is better. In other words, an education, and it will not be taken from her. And then you see the witness to the greatest event in human history. The first witnesses to the resurrection weren't Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, Thomas, none of them. It was the women. Why would you make that up in a, in a state and in a time when women's testimony was considered worthless why would you fabricate the women as the first witnesses? Wouldn't you make it Peter or James or some hero of the faith, as it were? You would do that if you were making it up. But if you were telling the truth, then you would say it was the women. Because the women were the first to see him. Because they remained faithful. Because they were the ones who served. 
in the church because they were the ones who were the lions of the faith. I don't think it's an accident that God chooses to come into this world incarnate through a woman and then he has women at his grave as well to see the new birth that he offers to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me just make one broad comment on that question and then just a footnote to uh, what Abdu said. For some of you reading the Bible, it may be a new thing. And don't be put off when you get into it and you realize that not everything is going to be clear on first read. My wife comes from England. I come from a colorful, loud, New Jersey, Italian-American family. (laughs) And the first time she came over, she was sitting in one room of the house. There was a glass door between her and my mom and I talking in the kitchen. And from her perspective, she saw my mom and I speaking in the kitchen, and then the voice is getting louder and louder, and our face is getting closer and closer, and my mom was making sauce at the time, so she's chopping garlic, and every time she would make an enthusiastic point, she would wave the knife in the direction of my face. (laughs) My wife, Jill, at the moment we were engaged, just almost ruined the whole marriage, but she honestly thought a war had broken out between my mom and I. And she thought we were going to have to leave. And then when finally things settled down, she cornered me in the side of the room and she said, Vince, is everything okay between you and your mom? I had no idea what she was talking about. (laughs) What she perceived as a knife fight was just two Italian Americans telling each other they loved each other. (laughs) And my point is this. That's my wife in the 21st century in a globalized world, coming from a country that speaks roughly the same language, growing up having watched American TV, and still the cultural difference was such that on first glance, it was not easy to interpret. Well, now let's go back to the Old Testament, a book written several thousand years ago in a vast number of cultures and cultures very different from ours. It takes some hard work, but it's supposed to take some hard work because every good relationship in your life and every meaningful relationship in your life is not easy, but takes some hard work. So don't be put off when that is the case. And just a a thought, Abdi was talking about the Canaanites and the atrocities that they were involved in. And one of the battles that took place in this judgment on the Canaanites was in Jericho. And oftentimes we read that passage and we think how horrible that God would have performed this type of judgment. Well, we have archaeological evidence now that that wasn't just a town of civilians. That was most likely a military post. There probably were not non-combatants there. In fact, there was one that we know of, Rahab, who probably ran a brothel or a bar for the soldiers. And not only is she saved from the judgment, but her entire family is, and she winds up in the lineage to Jesus. We are longing for justice, but we're repulsed by judgment. It's a very interesting aspect of our culture. When we think about the Canaanites and the sacrifice, the mass sacrifice of children, we cry out when we hear that and say, there has to be judgment. But then whenever we hear about the actual judgment, we're repulsed by it. Those are good intuitions, both of them. And that is exactly the heart of God. He loves every one of those children so much that there had to be judgment, but he also loves everyone so much, even those who have acted against him, that he can't bear to bring judgment on anyone. And if we fast forward the story, if we want to know just how much God hates judging people, if we want to know why he's depicted in both the Old and the New Testament as weeping when he has to judge, it's because ultimately he would prefer to go to judgment himself rather than to have to judge. That's the ultimate resolution of the story. We have someone who wants to step up to the mic and ask a question. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, My question is, as a new Christian, as a new Christian, um, when I go to talk to my friends about my new relationship with Christ, what... What is the best 
way to talk to them about it when they don't want anything to do with religion. Um, they say they can rely on themselves. They want nothing to do with it. They don't believe in it. What would be a good way to witness to them? Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll have a start. Um, congratulations. I am really excited for you. Uh, fantastic. <laughs> and, and I know that this is now a difficult season. Uh, and sometimes it feels like I'm going to make the decision to become a Christian and everything's going to be great. Uh, and, and sometimes it's tougher before it's better. Uh, I understand that. And, and when I became a Christian... Um, it was difficult on my family in particular. At the time, I probably didn't have the maturity to really appreciate how it would be difficult for them. But my family, I was the oldest sibling, the oldest cousin, the first in the family to go to college. And they sent me off to college as the teenage boy they had always known. And then they get me back after my freshman year. And in, some, in a very little sense, I'm a new person. Uh, and they're finding this very difficult. And they almost had to get to re-know me. And I was saying, look, why can't we just be happy about this? I'm treating you better as my parents. I'm treating my brother better. Why can't we just be happy? But from their perspective, there was this feeling of, well, look, we sent one kid off to college, and we loved that person. We got a different one back. We don't care if he's better or worse. We just want the one that we know and that we love. And now looking back, I can, I can see that that was reasonable. I also feel like there was a sort of implicit criticism that was going on. I didn't intend it, but they felt like perhaps I was claiming that they didn't raise me well because now I was saying Jesus Christ is the most important thing in life, and that was something that they hadn't taught me. And then I think maybe thirdly, uh, probably for my dad, who's probably listening, so you can correct me later, dad, if, if this is not correct. Um, but there was probably this feeling of almost infringement on his turf. Uh, and I give him credit for that because he took his responsibility as a father very seriously. Uh, and that was a deep value for him. And now all of a sudden I come home and I'm saying, well, there's this invisible father figure who is now my primary and first father figure. And I go to him first for discernment and advice. And understandably, that could have been really difficult. So I, I share all that with you because at the time, I couldn't see most of that. And now looking back, I can see why that was such a difficult period. In terms of actually explaining your faith and sharing your faith, here's something that I found helpful. Initially, I was a bit overzealous. I got home. I said, all right, everybody, we're having this Bible study. We're all having this Bible study. My family, my best friends, I got everyone together on a Sunday. I guilted them into it. We went through this apologetic book, and we were looking at all the arguments, and I was so excited, and they were probably making eyes at each other. We got to the last session, and there was a prayer in the back that you could pray if you wanted to become a Christian, you know, and I said, I explained the whole thing, and then I, you know, was going to pray this prayer, and you can pray this prayer, you know, if you want to say this too, and then as I went to pray, out of the corner of my eye, I saw my dad go, <laughs> like that, and I think he was thinking, if we all just pray this prayer, maybe Vince will shut up. <laughs> so that's where things started. I was, in a sense, especially with family and close friends, I was too fast, not realizing all of those challenges that would have been legitimate. And later what I did was I had this conversation. I said, look, this is really important to me. Uh, and my life really has changed because of who Jesus is and the way he's come into my life. But my relationship with you is so valuable to me. And that is something I want to have for our whole lives. And in fact, I want that to only get deeper and not more superficial just because we see certain things differently. So would you allow me to share what's so important to me? Not because I think you're necessarily going to immediately believe it, but I want you to know me. I want to know you genuinely. I want you to know me. I don't want to be guarding what I say in front of you because then over time we're going to drift apart. And I think if someone sees that actually the desire of your heart is for the relationship in the best way, 
then that will open doors to be able to share. And it may be quickly that someone sees the light of Christ in your life. It may be very far down the road. Uh, and in my case, with some of the important relationships in my life, it was 15 years. And from one year to the next, if you asked me if I was seeing progress, I probably would have said, seems exactly the same to me. But over 15 years, God was doing this slow and steady but faithful work so that the roots could go deep and that when people did come to finally accept Christ, we would understand each other. That relationship would be deep and then we could be in community with each other and with God on into eternity. That'd be my hope for you. I just want to add a, a sort of a practical addendum. What's your name, by the way? Amanda. Amanda. I want to add just a practical addendum to that as well, uh, is to realizing those challenges that people often have, because they do see this difference, right? Um, the first thing to do, I think, honestly, to engage with someone is to ask thoughtfully uh, worded questions. They don't have to be the best question. You don't have to be Perry Mason in that moment. You know, you don't have to do that. But you can ask thoughtfully worded questions, just thinking about what a person actually cares about. You know, the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, when he says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. That's the first thing, walk wisely toward them, making the best use of the time. What he means by that is don't be engineer-like in your efficiency. What he means is talk about what they care about. Use that time. And then he says, let your speech be eloquent, seasoned, or uh, gracious, seasoned with salt so you may know how you ought to answer each person. Not each question, not each objection, not each issue. Because issues, objections, and questions don't need answers. People need answers, and they use questions to get them. We answer people, not questions. But when you answer them, oftentimes a question is the best way to do it. And I gotta tell you this, this may give you, if you're not an apologist, you'll get some confidence in this because sometimes apologists ask the best questions, but sometimes non-apologists ask the very best questions. Um, uh, apologetics is the art and science of Christian persuasion, as it were. And it comes from 1 Peter 3.15. To give a, an apologia is to give a defense of the Christian faith. Oftentimes, though, when people who are non-Christian see you try to sort of ramrod an answer that didn't, to a question they didn't ask down their throat, they think you're not engaging in the art of apologetics to persuade them. They think you're engaged in the art of apologetics, making them sorry they even asked. Um, so you've got to be careful. But here's what I would say. You ask a question, a good example of someone who's not an apologist who asked an amazing question. My wife and I were having dinner with um, an atheist uh, friend of ours who is a doctor, very accomplished, very, very well accomplished, does a lot of great things in the world, a lot of medical missions he does and all these things. And she asked him a question, great question. She said, what gets you up in the morning? What inspires you? And he very magnanimously said, oh, people, helping people inspires me. You know, sort of a... a uh, Miss Universe kind of an answer, but, um, but it's a good answer. It's a valid answer. So my question back was, why? Why is that the case? If there is no God and we're just chemical machines, are you a physician or are you just an overly expensively educated mechanic? Which one are you? And he didn't like that because he's actually a physician. Now, here's the important point. This is important to remember. We had a lengthy discussion about what the difference was between having meaningful work that actually helps people and having meaningless work that gets you nowhere because the world's gonna ground down to a, to a, eventual to a heat death. The universe will just stop moving and existing. If you're a doctor, what you do is help people. If you're a lawyer, presumably, you will help people. If you're a mechanic, you're helping people. Whether a mechanic, whether a doctor, whether a lawyer, whether a judge, there is a meaning to what you do because the people you're helping have infinite value. That all started with a simple question from my wife, what inspires you? You don't have to say, what do you think about God? What do you think about Jesus? You can say that. But so my question for you, any of you today, is if you're not someone who believes that we have a transcendent value, what does inspire you? What does motivate you? These are excellent questions you can ask. You can ask. Because when you answer, when you ask those questions with the intent of actually listening to the, to the answer, don't listen to respond, listen to understand, and then you can respond. When you do that, you're living out what 1 Peter 3.15 says. Always be prepared to provide a reason, an apologia, a defense for the hope you have within you to anyone who asks. When he tells you, live a life full of hope, as a brand new Christian, you're going to be full of that hope. Live your life so hopeful that they say, what's with you? Then you can give them an answer.
I have another question from the floor. Thank you guys for coming out, by the way. Um, my question is, um, how does one know that Christianity is the one true way of living in a world that thinks that no, not one religion is superior than another and that we should all coexist? All religions sure. should coexist. Great question. So the question essentially is, is that given the world of pluralistic and multiple options, obviously, in terms of religious systems and even non-religious, and sort of the way the world culture goes is say that it's arrogant actually to say one way is the correct way. How can we actually know that there is one way? Let there be light. Um, <laughs> um, it's an excellent, excellent question. Fantastic question. I actually addressed this in Saving Truth, um, my latest book. I have a whole section on this. Um, first is the underlying assumption that pluralism, it's a good thing in the sense that no one worldview becomes forcibly dominant over others. We can't enforce Christianity or enforce Islam or atheism on people. People are trying to do these things, but we shouldn't because I don't think force actually leads to truth. I think debate, civilized debate leads to truth, and the problem with the statement that all religions are equal or maybe non, all equally invalid shuts down debate. When you call someone intolerant, you're no longer actually engaging in debate. You're just simply shutting them up. That's a way to force non-discussion. So we hear this phrase, right? All roads lead to God. You've heard this phrase most likely, and most likely some of you have heard this phrase, all roads lead to God. You've heard this, correct? Yeah. Okay, so here's the problem. The, the, the statement, all roads lead to God, is meant to respect all roads as if they're equally valid. It doesn't actually respect all roads. It disrespects all the roads because they don't even claim to lead to God. So if you're saying all roads lead to God, you're not taking any of them seriously. How do I know this? Let's take a look at Buddhism. Buddhism, as Buddha taught it, didn't teach you and me that we are going to go to heaven. It taught us that we don't even have a self. The self is an illusion. All we are is an accretion of karma. And that once you, whoever you is actually, works off your karma through the death, cycle of death and rebirth, you become extinguished. You don't go to God. Hinduism tells you that you are God. And that you are, that I'm God and you are God. Now, you're not a God and I'm not a God. We are all the God. So we're under the illusion of separateness. That is not the same thing that Islam teaches, which is that there is a God out there who is not me and that I am not to have relationship with him beyond master and servant. And that's all there is to it. And that when I go to heaven, I go to a paradise God creates for me, but he himself is not there. Christianity says that we were made to be in relationship with God, which is why Genesis chapter 3 says that God walked and talked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And we are eventually going to get back to the state where we see God face to face, where we're actually engaged in relationship eternally from him. So you see how all roads don't even claim to lead to God? So when you say all roads lead to God, you're not respecting them, you're disrespecting them because you're not taking them seriously. I respect the Muslim too much to say, you and me believe the same thing. Yeah. And they're diametrically opposed. I believe that God is triune, one in his nature, three in his persons. And because of that, God is truly great. A Muslim would say, that's blasphemy. I take it seriously. So how do I know then? Once we understand that this idea that they're all equally valid can't possibly be true, they could all be equally invalid, but they can't also all be the same. Now the question is, how do we know that Christianity is also true? I love the way you phrased the question because it wasn't just, how do we know they're false? That isn't it. It's how do we know this is true? And that comes back to me on two claims. First, that there is a God that exists, and I have numerous philosophical arguments. Vince gave some on a scientific level, but I think there's also philosophical arguments as well to believe that there is a God. The very fact that the universe itself, um, as a, the universe is contingent. In other words, it depends on something else to explain itself. Ultimately, you have to have a being you have to stop somewhere. Everything that exists must be explained by something else unless you come to an unexplained first cause. That's what God is. For a number of other reasons, I believe that God exists. But why the Christian God? Because Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, incarnate, who takes away the sins of the world. And then he dies on a cross, and then he rises from the dead. Now, if he was wrong, he would have stayed dead. If he was right, he would have risen from the dead. Because they asked him a very reasonable question. They said, by what, John chapter 2, and in other places, by what authority do you do these things? Who do you think you are? And he says, when you destroy this temple, meaning my body, I will raise it up again in three days. That's either true or it's false. An opinion is irrelevant. So if he died and stayed dead, 
we would have no reason to believe him. If he died and rose again, we have every reason to believe him. People often ask me, why Jesus and not Muhammad or Buddha or Confucius or Krishna? Here's the reason. Jesus died and rose from the dead, and guys who rise from the dead tend to have credibility. <laughs> So the question then becomes, how do you know that he rose from the dead? Without making a longer answer even longer, let me suggest this. I've done numerous debates online, and you can, we can get into this more, maybe some more questions about the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. I have four facts that are strong facts. In other words, scholars, whether they're Christian or atheist or whatever, who study the historical Jesus, say is true about the this historical Jesus. One, that he died by crucifixion. We have to have a death before we have a resurrection. That's kind of how it works. Um, and that's historically accurate. John Dominic Crossan says that his death by crucifixion is as sure a fact as any ever could be. Then we have the appearances to the disciples of the risen Jesus. Skeptical, non-Christian historians say that the disciples saw something that convinced them that they saw not the surviving Jesus, not the escaping Jesus, but the actual resurrected Jesus. So we see that. So we see that the appearance of the disciples. Then we see the skeptics, Paul and James. They're converted. James was a skeptic. You read this in the Gospels. Paul was an enemy of the Christian faith. I'm a trial lawyer. Now, when you have somebody on the other side who disagrees with you so ver 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 uh, violently in that sense that they're like the worst witness you could possibly have on, on, on the other side of you, but they suddenly switch their position because they realize you're right, what do you do with that witness? You put him on the stand, and you let him talk for days and days and days to the jury. The best kind of eyewitness testimony is somebody who thought you were so wrong who now thinks you're right, and it costs them something, too, to mm -hmm. say it. They're not just making it up. It costs them something. That's exactly what you have in Paul. It costs Paul everything. He was an enemy of the Christian faith and switched and claimed to be the champion of the Christian faith based on his claim, I saw him with my own eyes. If he didn't, he knew he was lying. Why would you die on purpose for something you knew was purposely a lie? That gets you nowhere. So we have the crucifixion, the appearances of the disciples, the skeptics Paul and James converted, and then you have the empty tomb. We know where it was. It was a Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. We know that it was empty. And the fact that women were the first disciples is what's called an embarrassing admission. That wouldn't be necessarily included in, an, in a factual claim unless it was true. And that we knew it was where it was, and we knew that three days later his tomb was empty. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is both a sword and a shield. It defends against the attacks of Christianity. But it also offers you and me the hope that we will be raised as he is raised, because he claimed and he said he, what we would. But it's also a sword in that it says that everything that comes against it is therefore false. So if you want to contend with the Christian faith, you contend with this central fact, the fact that says all other claims that deny the resurrection can't be true. But this one is true. And it's not just true in a way that excludes you. It's a way that it's true in that it includes you. He didn't die and rise for Christians. That doesn't even make any sense. He died and rose so that we could all know Jesus, know God. That's the whole point. I love that there's so much to say on this topic of the resurrection, and please continue to look into that. That was essential to my own journey to faith. And when I started to understand all that Abdu was talking about, and I was engaging with these Christian friends of mine, and I was thinking, wow, this seems like a compelling argument, but surely atheists and others on the other side must have just as strong arguments against the resurrection. I arranged meetings with two of the top New Testament professors at Princeton at the time because neither of them were Christians, and I thought they're experts in the field, so surely they would have alternatives. And one of them glanced towards a mass hallucination theory, which is riddled with problems and has earned no credibility in the scholarship when pressed, had nothing to defend it, the other professor told me that as a historian, he simply wasn't interested in the question. And there appeared to be this assumption that as soon as we begin to talk about miracles, we're not talking about history. And I've never been able to understand why he thought he could make that assumption at the outset rather than looking into the evidence and allowing that to determine it. So continue to look into this, but it is no exaggeration to say that the resurrection is the only historically credible, scholarly, plausible account for how you get from what should have been the movement ending death of Jesus 
to then the eruption of Christianity after the disciples are convinced that they have spent time with this man after he is dead. The evidence there is so strong. I just want to make one more point on why this is such an important question and why it's so compelling, especially in today's day and age. Many people are afraid to disagree with anyone else, especially we see this all the time on college campuses. Abdu, if I remember correctly, you were having a conversation with someone on a college campus, and he said, you may have to help me. I don't think it's my place to disagree with anyone. And Abdu said, sure you do. And he said, no, I don't. And Abdu said, you just did. <laughs> Right, like that's how quickly philosophically that unravels, but we're still very attracted to the position. And why? I think it's because in our post truth era, we've become afraid of truth. And the reason is because truth leads to disagreement. And then people are worried that as soon as you get to disagreement, you then head down the line from disagreement to devaluing those you disagree with, and then to intolerance and then to extremism, and then to violence, and then to terrorism. And if truth and disagreement start you down a path that's going to end down there, well, then better for me to look like a fool in front of Abdu and not disagree with anyone than to actually take a stance on something. Here's what I think is incredible about the Christian faith. We're in a culture where we're given this cultural ultimatum, therefore. Either love is greater than truth, and therefore we just flee from truth. Or truth is greater than love, and then we fight for truth, even if it means that we're a violent person in the making. Fight or flee. Love is greater than truth, or truth is greater than love. Either we flee from truth altogether, or we fight for truth and just try to shame anyone who thinks differently than us. That is the polarization we're seeing in our culture. The amazing thing is that Jesus refused to make that choice. Jesus' coming was an act of disagreement with us. His very coming was a statement that our lives had disagreed so badly with what he intended for them that we required his sacrifice. And yet, Jesus' coming was his very act of love for us, his most extravagant act of love for us. In Jesus' incarnation and atonement, we have love and truth perfectly united in a personal sacrifice. Not love is greater than truth, not truth is greater than love, but God is love and Jesus is the truth. Therefore, love equals truth and we do not make the choice between the cultural ultimatum. And then as Christians, we have to ask ourselves the same question that Jesus figured out how to answer for us. What does it look like for us to disagree with those who think differently than us through an act of radical personal sacrifice and generosity towards them? That is the model of disagreement that we need to present to a culture that I think is longing for it and in desperate need of it. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to pause the questions for a moment. Um, how many of you guys are enjoying this? I'm going to ask just for you guys to uh, just grab a seat real quick. We're going we're gonna to take an offering um, to put on an event like this um, and to bring these guys in and um, to be able to um, just encourage the believers and how to share their faith and how to come up against the objections of Christianity, um, we want to actually supplement that cost because we want to do this more often. Don't you agree? And so in saying that, um, I'm going to ask Deacon Corey Petway, who's over the evangelism ministry. Mike is down there. Oh, they have a, oh, excuse me. Thank you, Brittany. I'm going to ask, uh, as the ushers come forward, I'm going to ask him to uh, pray over the offering. And while the offering is being taken, I want you to also... 7 p.m., 163 Livingston Street. We have game nights, worship nights, squad nights, all kind of nights, but only on Friday nights. So, look, our next meeting is April 5th, Friday, 7 p.m., 163 Livingston Street. Come out, be a part of what God is doing in the lives of the young people in this generation. I'll see you next Friday. 
Hi everyone, my name is Glenn and I'm the director of Outreach at Movement. And I'm Wilma, I'm a servant leader in Movement. Movement is a young adult ministry ages 19 to 29 of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Our love for God and for people compels us to share Jesus with other young adults so that we can grow together in our faith as a family. If you're a young adult looking for a community, Movement is where to find it. Speaking of community, we have a couple of events coming up. On April 5th, we have a meeting right here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. We have a special musical guest, DJ Putnam, and it's going to be an amazing night of worship. So come on out and bring a friend. But if you can't make it on Friday, come on out to the Brooklyn Tabernacle Sunday services at either 9 a.m., 11 a.m., or 1 p.m. Along with a powerful message from our pastor, BJ Putnam will be the special guest in all three services. We love our food, and we want to get to know you at our after-service meetup on Sunday at April 14th. After our 1 p.m. service, we're going to go hang out at Hill Country Food Park to try amazing barbecue food and just get to know each of y'all. So follow up with everything young adults at our Instagram page, Movement BK. We, we hope to see you soon. Hi, my name is David, and I serve for the men's ministry right here in the Brooklyn Tabernacle. And we want to invite all males 16 years and up to the men's ministry man cave meeting on April 6th, Saturday, 10 a.m., right here in the main sanctuary. Come for a time of worship, fellowship, and to hear a powerful message from Pastor Craig Holiday, and he will be speaking on undefeated, what it is for a man to fight from victory and not for victory. Come and be blessed, and we're looking forward to seeing you. And remember, when you see me, say all in. Please visit our website for more events and services taking place right here at the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Okay, how are we all doing out there? It is so good to see so many people here tonight. Um, you know, just putting this together and just seeing so many people who are hungry and uh, are thirsty for um, just knowing and becoming more intimate with what God has for them always excites me. Um, we're going to resume our Q&A. We have a few more minutes. And so um, I'm going to ask you to stand up as you were. I have a question that has come through pigeonhole, so hold your question, and you get a chance to answer it. Ask it uh, after I finish this. And so one of the questions that have come through on the live feed we have here says, I have friends and colleagues who identify with the LGBTQ community who says they were born that way. How do I counter that, their claim? You know, I was uh, uh, at a public university, and a colleague of mine was speaking on different religious systems. They can't all be right, though they could all be wrong, and he was talking about this, and I was joining the Q&A panel, and we were going one at a time, so my colleague would answer, then another colleague would answer, and then me. So it went him, him, then me. And a young lady walked up to the microphone, and she asked a question very similar to this, but it was about her. She wasn't asking about countering the claim. She was asking for validating the claim. Like, look, I, I feel a certain way. I'm attracted to certain people, and those people are my same gender. What does Christianity have to offer to me? And my colleague, it happened to be my turn, so my colleague elbowed me in the ribs and says, you're up, big guy. <laughs> you know, you walk up to the microphone, and there's a moment of silence. There's this pause. And everyone in the room is wondering what you're going to say, including you. This is a very, this is a very serious question for her, because it wasn't just abstract. It wasn't a matter of countering or responding to something. It was actually ministering to someone. So, you know, what's interesting I said to her, and I'm going to couch my answer in these terms, if, if I could, is that I wasn't really interested in countering her claim that she was born that way, because some actually don't believe that. There are people within the LGBT community uh, who don't think you're born a certain way, that it's, things are culturally constructed. One LGBT group actually says that we're out there to uh, advocate for as many sexualities as there are people, which is just uh, it evidence that some people don't even believe that sexuality is a product of birth or a product of happenstance. It can be evolved based on preference. So I wouldn't even try to counter the claim necessarily. I would try to reach a person where they are. Remember, you answer each person, not each issue. And when you make LGBTQ an issue, you forget that there are people. And this is one of the things I think the church actually gets wrong on this, is that we are so 
driven by trying to champion a policy or to try to champion an institution that we forget that we're not pro-institution. The church has been pro the institution of marriage. We've been pro-marriage. Okay, that's fine. But in the, the discussion, the public discussion of being pro-institution of marriage, we forgot that we're actually pro-love. And others have claimed that, that they're pro-love. And who wins that discussion in the court of public opinion? The pro-love people do every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Stop being pro-institution. Start understanding what the Bible says. So I said to her this, that there are only so many worldviews out there to, to pick from, whether it's an atheistic worldview where Richard Dawkins says we are uh, machines for propagating DNA. It is every living object's sole reason for living. We're here to pro propagate DNA. So he might say that same-sex behavior, therefore, completely uh, rules you out of the ambit of your purpose of human beings. You can't propagate DNA. You know, I, I wouldn't say that he is anti-LGBTQ. I'd say that he's actually for it. I see no logical reason, given his worldview, to do that. Um, uh, in Islam, for example, she couldn't even ask that question in public in a Muslim country. In the pantheistic worldviews, there was a guy who came out in the royal family of India who came out as homosexual, and they were burning effigies of him in the streets. So it's not like there's a lot of options. The question isn't what the Christian worldview says. It's why it says it. So if, you, if someone says, I'm born that way, my response back to that, I often think to me is, and what does that mean? What does that mean? What, what, what follows from that? That therefore every inclination or idea that with which we're born is therefore valid? There are plenty of people who are born with things that they don't want or that they find to be you know, societally destructive or harmful, but others who have things that are not. Here's the reality. The Christian faith tells me and tells you, and this is what I told this young lady, that the Christian faith tells me that we're all born that way if what we mean is broken. All of us are broken in every way, not just because of our sexuality, but because of everything about us. It's not like this is the one thing that we, this is the one sin that Jesus didn't die for. This is the one issue that he didn't uh, try to uh, address. And therefore, if you believe this, that's it for you. We're all broken in every way, in every way, we're all broken. My colleague Sam Alberry, who is, by the way, same sex attracted, and submits those desires to Christ. Can't remember a time when he was opposite sex attracted. He can't remember a time of ever being that way, but he is a true died in the world believer because he submits himself to the authority of Christ instead of the authority of himself. That is not discipline. You would hate if I said this, but I think it's true. That's heroism. Because every moment of every day, he submits that to the Lord. Not a passing fancy or a thing he knows he shouldn't do, like don't eat cheeseburgers occasionally. This is part of his life. So I wouldn't counter something as opposed to offer something. This is what I offered to the young lady. I said, why does the Bible say what this, the Bible says about sexuality? Why does it say it? It says that sexuality is to be expressed between a man and a woman within the bonds of marriage. Why? Why? Not because some dusty old people in some dusty old place said, I don't like that behavior, it's icky, and therefore I'll use God to judge that and kind of control your behavior. That's not why it says that. It's not arbitrary. It's not limiting your freedom. It's protecting what is sacred. You, young lady, I said to her, you are beautifully and wonderfully made in God's image. You are not a cosmic accident. And because you are beautifully made in his image, therefore you are inherently sacred you, you bear his image. No one can take it from you, not even you. You bear his image and you're sacred. If you are the product and you're sacred, then the process by which you came about was also sacred. And if sexuality between a man and a woman is the process by which a sacred human being is made, then the process itself is sacred and has to be protected because that which is sacred often needs that protection because when it becomes anything you want it to be, or anything that, based on your in, in, strong ingrained feelings, then it becomes common. Then it becomes whatever you want, whatever you want it to be at any time. And it loses its sacredness. It loses its hang of otherness, as I heard one author say. So the Bible says what it says, to protect that which is sacred. Why is it sacred? Because it is a unity of diversities. I, as a man, am different than my wife. Not only biologically, but psychologically and mentally. 
just get married and you'll find that out. <laughs> How is it possible that two people who can be this different are unified? That's what the Bible says, the two shall become one flesh. You know what that word one means, comes from in the, in the Hebrew? It doesn't mean one numerical. It means, if the word is echad. Echad doesn't mean numerically one. It means united. It means united. You are unified in your diversities. There's a unification of those diversities. Two things coming together. The Bible actually affirms the validity of women and the validity of men by saying, in his image, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In other words, you bear God's image in your femaleness. And I bear God's image in my maleness. And together, when we come together in, 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 a, in a communion of marriage, I and you reflect the divine who is a unity of diversities. If I swap you out for someone just like me, I lose something in the process. I lose the tang of that divine image that I get to reflect. God wants to protect that for you and for me, no matter what our proclivities or our desires might be. And there's plenty of people who are heterosexual who do it all the time and they violate that very same thing, by going outside of the bonds of marriage and failing to honor their commitments. Heterosexual does not mean sexually moral. It just might mean sexually normative, but it's not sexually moral. I know plenty of heterosexuals who are anything but. So stop reaching down and start reaching out. But the important thing to understand is this unity of diversities. That unity of diversity, we get to reflect that with another person because that reflects the divine. God is one in his nature and three in his persons. You are given the opportunity, the blessing of reflecting the divine in the unity of marriage between a man and a woman. Now, do you have to be married to do that? No, absolutely not. There is an inherent wholeness in singleness. Jesus was single. He was not broken. Paul was single. I don't think he was missing out on life. Marriage does not fix you. It does not. And it will not. You know why? Because you're married to a broken person. <laughs> as broken as you. It's when Christ becomes the center, and now there's that three persons in the unity that reflects the divine nature. And then finally, it signals something. It signals the marriage at the end of the world. At the end of the world is not just judgment. There's a wedding where the limited, finite, sinful bride of Christ, which is now cleaned up and made beautiful, wearing those robes, marries the infinite, always pure, always holy God, it's again, the unity of diversities. Marriage is the opportunity to reflect that. I said, that is what God wants for you. And every one of us is trying to run from it, whether it's through same-sex attractions or other things, or it's through looking at the idea of marriage and saying, the whole thing is just bunk. We're running from it. You don't have to be married to experience it, but when you actually willfully disengage from that unity of diversity, you're running from something that God offers to you and to me. So that's the young lady. There she was with tears in her eyes, crying her eyes out. We prayed together afterwards. Here's what I would say to you, and I'll end. We are looking to be understood in our struggles. Don't think of people who have same-sex attractions of whatever stripe to be just completely rebellious as if they were somehow more rebellious than the rest of the world. Remember something, they, whoever they are, are not they, you were once they. <laughs> Remember this, Thomas Bracken wrote in his poem, Not Understood, it's a wonderful understanding, a, a, a way to put it, that we have to come to grips with these things in a way that's gentle and light, but truthful and uncompromising. He says, not understood, we move along asunder, our paths grow wider as the seasons creep. Along the years, we marvel and we wonder why life is life, and then we fall asleep, not understood. Not understood how many breasts are aching for lack of sympathy, ah, day by day. How many cheerless, cheerless, lonely hearts are breaking. How many noble spirits pass away, not understood. Oh God, he says, that men would see, would, would see a little clearer or just judge less harshly when they cannot see. Oh God, that men would draw a little nearer to one another. They would draw nearer to thee, and then be understood. This young lady was looking to be understood, not preached at. And when I wanted to show her, I think you can do it. If you understand why the Bible says what it says, is that it is all about human value and not about a set of rules. But the set of rules sometimes actually dignifies human value. And that's why we were able to.
That's a beautiful answer to perhaps the question of our time. And oftentimes people say apologetics is not about apologizing, but sometimes it is. And sometimes we need to be willing to put our hand up and say we have not always articulated God's vision for sexuality as clearly as we could have or with the heart that we should have. And sometimes that's why people are confused. Uh, and just, just an anecdote of a confusion of that sort uh, in my life was when a friend wanted to give my wife and I a gift before we got married, uh, and she couldn't make the wedding, so she came, uh, and she presented us with a card and a gift. We turned around the card, we read the card, we started laughing hysterically in her face, and she was thinking, why are they laughing so hard at my lovely card? And we turned the card around, uh, and she wrote this beautiful card, and then at the end, she meant to write, wishing you all the best, Jen. But obviously, we hadn't done a great job communicating our faith and our vision for sexuality. And it was very odd to her that we had not had sex with one another yet. And instead, she just unknowingly wrote, wishing you all the sex. Jen. Our favorite wedding card. Here's a question that I really like to ask people and that we can ask of ourselves as well. If God has something to say about sex and sexuality, and if he exists, then do you think we should take that seriously? I like to sometimes just start the conversation there, because if someone says no, well, then the conversation really needs to be about why do you think that your intuitions on the matter would trump God, the creator of the whole universe? If someone says yes, if God does exist, and if he has something to say on the matter, then we should take it seriously. Well, then great. Then that's our more fundamental disagreement is actually about the existence of God. So let's burrow down and really treat that. And then if we come to the conclusion that God exists, then let's take seriously what he has to say about sex and sexuality. That's an approach to the conversation that I like to take that I find quite helpful. Probably the most powerful experience I had in a conversation on this issue not long ago was with a young woman who came down after I had preached at a church, came down to the front, shared that several years ago she had come out as gay. She had left the church. She had assumed the church didn't want anything to do with her. She had assumed that God didn't want anything to do with her. But when she told her parents, these were the first words out of her father's mouth and really made me ask the question of myself, what would have been the first words out of my mouth? And the first words out of her father's mouth, Christian parents, not pleased with what they were hearing, but her father's first words were, I have given my life to be your father, and nothing you could ever do could change my love for you. I'm sure that they had many more conversations after that. I'm sure that they dug into what God's vision for sex and sexuality is, but those were the first words out of his mouth, and I think that was so important. And I credit my colleague Sam, who Abdu mentioned with this. He often goes to the verse Mark 10, 29 when talking about this issue. And if you look at it later, basically it says, Jesus says, that those who have laid down something significant and counted the cost in order to follow him, he says there will be a hundredfold a hundred times as much. And then he says, not only in the life to come, but even in the present age. It's quite a remarkable promise. And some of the things that he talks about laying down focus specifically on family and on relationships. That's a huge challenge to those of us in the room who are Christians and who are members of a church. If someone on this issue lays down something significant with respect to sexuality or with respect to gender in order to count the cost to follow Jesus, is there 100-fold waiting for them when they choose to submit themselves to Christ and become members of our churches? Is there a hundredfold waiting for them in terms of relationships, in terms of real family, in terms of the invitations they receive for Christmas dinner? Sam would say, we need to be really careful 
not to attempt to make Jesus a liar. He made that promise and he commissioned us as the church to make sure that it's true. When someone lays something down, they receive a hundredfold, not only in eternity, but even in this life. And interestingly, the sermon I was preaching that day when this young woman came down to the front, I used the example of our colleague Hassan who ministers in northern Nigeria, and he has counted the cost. He has been shot at twice. There's a bounty on his head. They kept burning down his church. We finally sent a fireproof tent so they could continue meeting as a church. They've now torn that apart. They keep meeting in the open air. He has counted the cost. And so often we express Christianity as if it's just a cherry on top of our already good life. That is not the gospel. Every single one of us is asked to count the cost of following Jesus. And when she heard about someone who had counted the cost and was not living an easy life in order to follow Jesus, but was genuinely experiencing a hundredfold in terms of the fruit that was in his life and the love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and the community that he had, then she thought, maybe I could do that as well. And she came down and she said, those words of my human father, I have given my life to be your father and nothing that you could ever do could change my love for you. She said that all the way through the service as she heard the worship music and as she heard the word preached, she just knew deep in her soul that God, her heavenly father, was saying to her, those are not only your human father, father's words to you but those are my words to you as well in the person of jesus i have literally given my life in order to be your father and nothing you could ever do could change my love for you well unfortunately um we've come up on the hour we can take only one more question i I apologize but we're past nine o'clock and uh, I know some people want to leave, but we'll, we'll take your, your question, young man. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Sebastian. This question comes on behalf of my boss. All right, so he asked, why did God have to take his son? And this is just a follow-up. It's the last one. And why did my son have to die the way he did in a motorcycle accident? One more time. Say that again. This question comes on behalf of my boss. He asked, why did God take his son? And is his son paying for his sins? And why did his son have to die the way he did in a motorcycle accident? Yeah. Um, Sebastian's your name, right? Your name's Sebastian? Yes. Okay. Boy, I can really feel the force of what your, your boss is asking. Whenever someone asks a why would God question, I always get nervous. Not because there aren't answers, just because... A why would God question asks me to crawl inside the mind of an infinitely knowledgeable being and then make a guess as to what he would say. That's why why would God questions should make us all a little nervous and we just answer them flippantly. So I want to take his question. It's a powerful question. It's his last question of the night. I think it's important for us to um, reflect on the depth. He's not looking just for, you know, give me the logical syllogisms that help me understand logically how it is that God could allow these things. A couple of things. It's interesting that he paired the two. He pairs God giving his own son, and then he lost his son. It's, it's fascinating all by itself, the degree to which I think even he sees a melding of those two things, that God gives his son, and he lost his son. It's important to understand that in the Christian faith, when God gives his son, he doesn't do it just because he feels like it. It's not divine child abuse. God the Son, who is an equal part of the Trinity with God the Father, who's equally co-equal with God the Father, voluntarily says, they're all in very serious trouble down there. I will go. Someone's got to go. I will go and give my life. Now, was it easy? Was it like... No problem, no big deal. No, absolutely not. That's why we have the Garden of Gethsemane prayer where Jesus prays his stress so hard that he begins to sweat blood. And he says, Father, if it be possible, take this cup, meaning the cup of God's wrath, from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. But it's interesting, you have that phrase, and then you have Jesus also saying, when they are talking to him and challenging his authority, he says, I lay my life down of my own accord. No one takes it from me, and I have the power to raise it back up again. So he submits to the Father's will, 
but he does it himself voluntarily. Do you see that happening? Why does God have to do it? I think it's part of what I was answering, uh, beginning to discuss in my, in my, in my lecture, actually my, my opening talk, was first, if God exists and he's a perfect being, then he would be perfectly just. And everything that we do, therefore, would necessarily, when it goes against justice, would necessarily offend him. If it didn't, then what we do is meaningless. Whether we're good or we're bad, it doesn't matter, because it's arbitrary. God could say, nah, they're kind of sorry. He cried a little bit, no big deal. Just do better next time. And then nothing we say actually has any lasting effect. But if he's actually truly, infinitely holy, then everything we do has an effect. Everything we do does have an effect. In fact, that's how you know God loves you. And I was at an open forum and a young lady, a Muslim woman, walked up to the microphone and said, you talked about self-sacrifice as being evidence for God's, for, for the, God's greatness in Christianity. She says, but doesn't sacrifice imply weakness? And doesn't weakness therefore make God not great? I said, why would you say that? She says, because essentially what we do affects him. And if what we do affects him, then he can be affected by us and we're finite and he's infinite. How could that possibly be? That just seems to suggest he's weak. I said, rather than thinking of it that way, why don't you think of it as him being infinitely loving? Because if you reject him and he feels a nothing, then you mean nothing. But if you reject him and he sees the rejection and he's so moved by it that he knows the only way to actually restore your relationship with him is that a penalty must be paid because he can't stop being just and he stops being God. But he also can't stop being forgiving because then he stops being that God. How is God both at the same time? That's what the cross is all about. Why would God have to do it? One could say that God won. There's an aspect of having to do it. He has to do it because he has to be just and forgiving. And the cross allows him to be both at the same time. Legally speaking, for example, as a lawyer, I can tell you there's a perfect analogy for this. It's called a guarantor. Now, if you and I were involved in the transaction. Let's say I was a landlord, you were a tenant, and you came to me and you wanted to sign a lease with me. And I said, okay, what's your credit history? And it's lousy. Let's just say you've broken lease after lease your whole life. And you say, I'm saying, uh, you want me to let you have an apartment here? Why would I do that? And you say, oh, here's why. And in, in walks your billionaire uncle, who's never welched on a lease in his life, always had perfect credit, always done everything perfectly, has unlimited funds, and he says, give him the, give him the lease because if he defaults on the lease, you can come after me for the money. Is it unjust for me to go after his uncle for the money when you welch on your lease? No, because the uncle volunteered and he has infinite funds to pay it. So it's not unjust, it's called a guarantor. We do it in the law all the time, it's called a cosigner. It's a guarantor. We do it in the law all the time, and it's not inherently unfair. But what happens in the world is that you get off scot-free, so to speak. But in the Christian faith, that's not what happens. When Jesus says, I will be your guarantor, I have unlimited funds to pay your debt for you. And you say, please. And he says to the Father, I will pay the debt for him, and he pays it for me. I don't get off scot-free. Believe it or not, I don't. What happens is Jesus says, I'll do this for you. Do you understand what happens next? You are going to start to look more and more like me. You are going to become self-sacrificial. It's called the process of sanctification, where when you accept what Jesus has done for you, it isn't simply a vamp being a vampire Christian, as D.A. Carson says. You don't just want Jesus for his blood. You want Jesus for, what, for, for, his being, for being Lord. He becomes Lord of your life. So he says, I will pay this for you. If you accept it, there's a transaction that happens and you will start to look more and more like me. And by the way, that means you're gonna have to start sacrificing for others as well. So why does he have to do it? Because he satisfies justice and he satisfies forgiveness at the same time without compromising either. And in the process, you and I are actually made to look more and more like the self-sacrificial son. Now why does he let people die in motorcycle accidents and other tra tragedies. I asked, my friend asked that question about his mother. Same question. How could God value me or my mother when he let her die of cancer when I was 10? That was the question he asked. And here's, I gave you part of the answer, but here's where it started. I said, if God is, but the first thing I did, I'll tell you this, is I didn't answer him. I just simply 
sympathized. I've experienced my share of loss too in my life. Never someone that close to me at that such a tender, tender age. I can't even imagine what that feels like. It's what I said, we, we've been discussing things for quite some time. If God exists, then he's a being of infinite knowledge. He knows all past things, all present things, all future things, and all future possible things. In other words, you could have chosen not to come here tonight. And God knows all the billions of different consequences that would have happened if you chose not to come here. And he knows that you did come here, and that you would have come here, and that you will come here. He knows all that too. So isn't it possible then that a being with this kind of infinite knowledge of the spider web of future history could allow, not cause, but could allow some instance of suffering, even if it's terrible suffering, it's not his will in terms of that he creates it, but it's his will and that he might allow it for some greater possible good in the future. That he could allow it for some greater possible good. My friend said, nope, not possible. I said, not possible? What do you mean not possible? He says, how can you tell me that the tsunami that happened in 2004 in the Indian Ocean that killed a quarter of a million people and left millions homeless, how could you possibly say that God allowed that for some greater possible good? I asked him, I said, are you telling me that you know that it's not possible at all? It's infinitely impossible? If you claim to know it's impossible, then you claim to know all the future. And if you know all the future, you're using your knowledge of all the future to disprove the being who has knowledge of all the future. You see that the, the, the self-defeating nature of that. But here's the real answer to you. You see, he agreed, okay, it's possible God could allow suffering. And that's when he asked the question about his mother. Not before, but after I said that. He said, okay, it's fine. And he asked questions about his mom. My response was, and this is after quick prayer, and I just prayed honestly, I said, God, please, give me some, I don't know if I'm gonna see him again for a long time. He's obviously hurting, he's obviously never found an answer in a blind, pitiless, indifferent atheism. The universe does not care about that, your boss's son's life or death was meaningless in that sense, unless there's a God, and there is one, and so his life and his death, both his life and his death have some kind of a meaning. So I told my friend that it's one thing to say, philosophically speaking, that's a nice idea, you know, God could allow suffering for some greater possible evil, and it's philosophically valid. Sure, it's possible. It's a nice theory, but that's an uncomforting theory, isn't it? it doesn't bring my son back, my mother back. Here is the hope that it leads to. It's not just an intellectually satisfying answer because a Jew could say that, a Hindu could say that, a Muslim could say that. God allows suffering for some greater possible good. A Christian doesn't just believe in the theory. A Christian abides in the hope that it's real. Not because God could allow it, because God did allow it. He allowed his own son to undergo unjust suffering for himself. Not for some theoretical possible good, but for the greatest good there could possibly be the salvation of the entire world. It's not just theory in the Christian faith, it's history in the Christian faith. So I find it so poignant and so profound that he couples why did God give his son with why did I lose my son? I would never venture to answer the question why did you, what, did you lose your son? I have no idea. But what I do know is that the answers I don't have, I can live in a perpetual hope based on the answers I do have. What I don't know doesn't have to hold me back into a, serious, a, a, a life of darkness because there are little pinpoints of light based on what I do know. And I do know that Jesus rose from the dead and that God can use suffering for a greater possible good. Even though I can't see it, I can trust it because I know it already did happen. Friends, as we wrap this up, I wanna tell you, are very deep and profound questions, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. But this hope, based on history, is not just wishful thinking, it's not a delusion. Investigate it for yourself. Take in your hand the Gospel of John, look at it and say, who is this man? What is this all about? And maybe even pray, whether you think God's there or not, not wasted, air, not, not wasted breath. Is this true? And if you're real, reveal yourself to me. In the hope of the resurrection and all other things, the creation of the universe, the reality of morality, the meaning to our endeavors, all these things allow us to persist in hope when life seems hopeless. Because the God of all comfort, the one who is the hope, the one who is the